My name is Bonnie Griffin, and today I will be talking about reading before reading, sensual elements as social indications. So today my goal is to share my process of discovery and investigation among these colorful books that enable me to tackle misconceptions and assumptions about 18th century books by investigating their materiality. Let's call this reading before reading. <coughs> Now, before we examine the texts themselves, we can first read the physical elements of these books, how they were constructed, how they were decorated, and what these technical details can reveal about the society of readers who had intimate access to these books. I will discuss several of our most outstanding examples of decorated books in the Walks collection to illustrate the type of reading my project demanded. In delving into these display cases, we can read the compilation of stories as illustrative of the particularities of printing in 18th century France. Take, for instance, the diminutive book Lettre de Monsieur Hue, or Letter from Monsieur Hue, appearing in our display, just over here. Appearing to contain a single story, this slim leather-bound book actually encases three smaller ones. Firstly, the letter from Mr. Hue to Mr. de Segre on the origin of novels. Secondly, Turkish letters. And thirdly, an essay of new fables dedicated to the king, followed by various poems and an epistle on the progress of printing. These three novels struck me as an exceedingly eccentric assortment. I wonder what would induce any bookseller to compile such an utterly bizarre assembly of writings. Such a combination seems kind of nonsensical. Why it is essential to understand that back then, the process of printing and bookbinding generally occurred separately. An author would submit their work to a printing guild, would then lose their rights to the text, which could be altered and illustrated, and in fact the original manuscript was nearly always modified. The handwritten original had to be decrypted and corrected by the printer's guilds, acting as editor. Then a printing press with movable type would put the text to paper, possibly with the addition of petite printed woodcut or copper plate images, because the process permitted simultaneously printing of whole text and of illustrations. So perhaps the most monumental book, also in this case, in both size and significance, to our collection is this volume of Diderot's Encyclopédie, exhibiting a page depicting the process of printing with movable type, a technology used in the production of the books you see here. Every individual letter, every single letter, would have been to painstakingly placed upside down and backwards in order to be legible when printed. Luckily, we don't have to do this technology when writing our essays. Printing involved a constant rapport between those setting the letters in place to compose each printed page and those in charge of pressing the letters into the paper itself. This encyclo uh, encyclopedia was once an extravagant purchase, as a tremendous amount of time and effort would have been required to assemble so massive a volume compared to these other comparatively little books. Partly due to the difficulty involved in fitting words correctly to hundreds of pages, printers sometimes resorted to inserting small woodblock images just to fill space and to maintain consistent formatting. L'univers enigmatique, or the enigmatic universe, also displayed here, is full of such images that stimulate the imagination. At the following stage, once the pages were printed and ready for purchase, the customer was at liberty select to select any number of tales, letters, or writings in the form of unbound pages. Then, the onus was on the customer, not the printer, to either bind them separately or together at his or her own discretion. <coughs> Binding was, of course, a costly process requiring labor, leather, and embossing, sometimes done with gold leaf, because why not? So combining diverse and perhaps discordant texts together ensured both the beautiful cover and the more practical aspect of only needing one cover for several texts. While working with such contradistinctive works, we sometimes discovered that books bearing only one title contained a myriad of texts, ranging from religious works, essays on morality, pornographic stories, and travel accounts. So don't trust a book by its cover, indeed. This stage of bookmaking allowed for personal expression. The buyer, depending on their wealth, could envelop their pages in everything from decorative marbled papers, which you'll see a lot of today, to the finest leather embossed with this gold leaf stamping and other small sensual touches like a delicate ribbon bookmark. Anything to add both personal flair and exhibit aesthetic distinction and fine taste to the extent that the appearance of the book was perhaps more impressive than the content itself. One particular decorative element warrants elaboration, marbled paper, which really commanded my attention for this. As you may have already noticed, two of my display cases, one here and one not so uh, conveniently back there, um, are dedicated to the appreciation of books featuring the finest of swirling, speckled, and spiraling colorful end pages, which served as the initial source of my interest in the material aspects of the books of the Walks collection. 
The mid-18th century could be considered the apotheosis of an elevated degree of artistic specialization in bookmaking, which coincided with the so-called golden age of French papermaking, which occurred between 1670 up until 1740. This specialization was by no means universally accessible, nor practiced, as these techniques were actually jealously guarded by the guilds who mastered them, until Diderot published an article on marbling technique, which now provides us with one of the few written sources on the process to survive the era. Put quite simply, the process of marbling itself is fairly straightforward. A sizable basin would be filled with a thick liquid surface called a size. Inks or colors would be artfully deposited across the surface, either left to float freely or be twisted and swirled into patterns, which could then be lifted off onto a sheet of paper, carefully laid over the mixture, then dried until it could be used. However, the varyingly complex, multicolored, and completely unique marbled end papers seen in this collection actually required a high degree of skill and technical knowledge that deserve our attention. Now, in some instances, a few extra steps were required to get marbled paper. Dutch marbled paper, for instance, required paid duties. So to avoid paying it, decorated paper would sometimes be wrapped around Dutch toys in guise as packaging and then later carefully removed and sold to bookminders. Very sneaky. Now, I'll go into some detail for a few of the most stunning and illustrative examples in these cases, but of course more information can be found in the interactive, so please check it out. So, uh, one particularly striking example of marbling can be found in the Histoire de Madame de Bellerive, or the story of Madame de Bellerive. Seemingly insignificant details, like the colors used, red, green, blue, and golden ochre, tell us more than we may initially assume. For instance, these four colors were the most prevalent during the aforementioned golden era of paper decorating, whereas most marble pages dating after this era generally exhibit red, yellow, and blue. Perhaps a more typical example of marbled paper likely dating to this later 18th century with these three indicative colors can be found in Le Temple de Genide, or the Temple of Genide, gracing our display. Also there, I believe. This book is particularly unique as it features marbled pages lined with leather serving as the cover rather than the full leather cover encasing most of the books on display. Perhaps the author could not afford a full leather binding or but nonetheless wished to add some color to their book or just wanted their book ready quicker. I could understand that. The pattern here, described um, as snail or curl, and you'll have to take a look at it to know what I'm talking about, could be formed using a comb to swirl the colors at repeating intervals. And perhaps the finest book displayed in my selection is The Voyage Pittoresque des Environs de Paris, or A Picturesque Journey Around Paris, which gives us a rich resource of material to read into the aesthetic priorities of France's classiest readers at the time. Take, for instance, the marbled edges, which speak to national differentiation in paper decorating. Germany, Holland, England, and France, among others, all produced and traded their own unique marbled paper, but France stood out as the innovator and original producer of these marbled book edges. Among an aesthetically obsessed bourgeoisie and aristocracy, these little flourishes and elegant additions added a flair that made it much, if not more, of an impression than the literary work itself, as yet another means of setting oneself apart. This ornate book also begets an audience, invest, inviting us to question just how such a book would have been displayed. Now, initially, books didn't necessarily receive special attention in how they were stored or displayed. However, as simultaneous movements involving augmenting collections and ever-advancing techniques in decorating such books, an interest developed not only in crafting beautiful books, but exhibiting these works of art in extravagant ways. So, first furniture, and then entire rooms were assembled to accommodate this development. These various designs of furniture created to house books reflected several concerns, the preservation of the book, a treasured object, and a way to exhibit one's good taste and high status. We may be sensing a theme here. These various des oh, whoop, I just said For distinguished individuals, mere furniture was insufficient and an entire room would be set aside as private office and personal library. Displayed here are conseils pour former une bibliothèque peu nombreuse mais bien choisie, or advice on assembling a small yet well-chosen library, serves as a guide to the assemblage of the right books to ensure an impressive, respectable collection. For those exemplary members of society, lawyers, philosophers, academics, and magisterial figures, a personal library was in fact a very necessary material demonstration of erudition and taste, which demanded not only exquisitely constructed books, but also fine art, imported rugs, porcelain, and other tasteful displays of wealth, which complicates our contemporary understanding of what exactly a personal library was. Now, personal may have been a relative term. Certain individuals or institutions boasting extensive collections selectively opened their doors to gens de lettres or savants, basically the most eminent scholars. 
Others allowed a wider audience, at the price of admission, of course, with the creation of the cabinet de lecture, which also served to encourage potential buyers. Of course, wealthy and distinctive individuals weren't the only ones who sought access to books, so how did lower socioeconomically classed readers come to collect books? Unprosperous individuals living in urban centers or the countryside could actually buy books without leaving their home. Sounds good, right? Thanks to the colporteur, a sort of door-to-door -door salesperson, but selling reading materials. A somewhat unregulated trade, those who found themselves short on funds could also resell their own books. So clearly we have to nuance our understanding of book ownership and acquisition. We may typically assume that either one could not afford books or could only afford modest or unbound books, like the featured Almanac de Jean d'Esprit, or Almanac for Good-Spirited People, with only a marbled paper cover and no leather. Or we assume people splurged on lavishly bound and decorated tomes, like our prized Lettre d'une Peruvienne, or a letter of a Peruvian woman. However, a secondhand book trade thrived. There's a risk in going back in time and studying, say, the Wax collection, because there's a temptation in assuming that all these books were purchased and assembled by one owner. No, any book could have been inherited, bought, uh, borrowed, bought secondhand, stolen, and so on. In, in short, book ownership and access was no straightforward matter, and the wide variety of our books displayed here were touched, displayed, possessed by an even wider variety of individuals hailing from a broader, uh, broader social range than we may initially assume. So my primary goal in sharing my discoveries today is expressing the necessity in opening, one, opening one's mind and allowing for greater nuance and discarding assumptions when studying books from 18th century France, and elsewhere, of course, in using the material aspects of the book to question the construction, content, readership, and the socio-cultural context of books, we realize there is no one easy definition or conclusion to be made. There is no single quintessential form of book constructed and decorated in one precise way. There is no one type of reader, and there are a myriad of ways to gain access to a book. So what started out as my mere aesthetic attraction to the beauty of these marbled pages actually transformed into the realization that a tremendous amount of reading can be done before one even gets past the title page. I would like to invite you all to explore my displays and interactives later to gain further insight into the other uh, revelations I gained while exploring pages, if not the words, of these works of art and testaments to 18th century French culture and society. Thank you.